Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say to you as individuals and as a movement, if you're going to be something, if you're going to do something, you have to be proud of yourself. And you have to be proud of your heritage as a labor movement, just as you are proud of your family or your religion or whatever else it may be. And I've always been associated with the labor movement. I told the President of the United States at a private luncheon that we had not long ago. I said, Mr. President, you just have to understand in our discussions, there's just a couple of things that I may be slightly prejudiced on, amongst others. But I said, I never would have been in the United States Senate had it not have been for my friends in the labor movement. And please don't ever ask me to do anything that would in any way injure or cripple or weaken that movement. I said, other than that, you can ask for almost anything. But I have some loyalties and I have some priorities. And one of my loyalties has been to this great movement. And I'll tell you why, not because you're perfect, not because there hasn't been a scoundrel now and then, because none of us are perfect. We've all made mistakes, and God only knows. Some of us have made too many. But we judge a movement like this by its overall record, and we judge the labor movement on what it has done to lift the standard of living for millions and millions and millions of plain American citizens who today can have their own home, who today have decent working conditions, who today can send their children to a good school. It never could have happened without you. Be proud of it, dear friends. Be proud of it. And just remember this. Mom said, yeah, they'll take your picture if you wipe your eyes with the Kleenex. Well, that's all right. Take it. <laughs> the fellow doesn't have any tears, doesn't have any heart. <laughs> the history of the labor movement needs to be taught in every school in this land. We need to know our roots. As they say, we learned about roots, didn't we, in 1976. We need to know who we are, what we are, where we come from, how we got here. You've heard me say this before. It is imperative. It is a part of American history. This great nation wasn't built just because somebody sat behind a table and finagled and even financed, important as finance is, and it is important. Important as planning is, it is important. Important as design is, and it is important. Ultimately, it's the worker. It was the worker that built the railroads, that dug the tunnels, that dredged the rivers, that built the ports, that built the huge skyscrapers, put in the highways, and built the homes. America is a living testimonial to what free men and women organized in free democratic trade unions can do to make a better life. And we ought to be proud of it. Just remember that. <laughs> the 
The first thing that any authoritarian or any two-bit dictator does is to abolish free labor. That's the first thing. Long before they get the expropriation of land, long before they get to even putting into jail the so-called political prisoners, they abolish a free labor movement. And in America, thank God, instead of abolishing, abolishing our labor movement, we're going to strengthen it. And workers today that are not organized, many of them particularly in the Deep South, workers today that do not have the working conditions that they ought to have, are going to have a better chance. Nobody's going to give it to them on a platter. It's not going to be easy. But they're not going to have everything set against them. They're going to have a chance once we get this labor reform bill passed so that when they have a vote in their plant and the vote is taken and if the union wins, the union is recognized and there's none of this nonsense of delay and litigation and obstruction such as has prevented the labor movement of the United States from its legitimate growth. Oh, what have you done with free organized labor? Collective bargaining, better wages. Now, everybody, every time anybody gets a little better wages, somebody says, inflation, right away. The banker raises the interest rates. They say, sound monetary policy. <laughs> you know that. Thank God for collective bargaining. What it's meant to the income of our families what it's meant for working conditions, what it's meant for grievance procedures, what it's meant for job security, what it's meant for re recreation and vacation so that families can get together and travel across this country, what it's meant for pensions, and what it's meant for health. Millions of Americans today have health care, not because the government has passed it, because we haven't had the guts to do it but because negotiators have sat down at the table with their employers and have worked out a health and welfare pension program commonly called fringe benefits, which makes it possible for you as a union member to have good health care with the best of doctors in the best of hospitals and not have to go broke during the whole process. Isn't that a marvelous thing? Now, who does that hurt? See, we need to tell people about this. The doctors get their money. The hospitals get their money. The family still survives. The community is better off. What's all this nonsense about that when you give a little wage increase for a worker, and of course, by the way, you generally negotiate, you know, three-year contracts. And when they put it in the paper, they put the whole three-year contract in as if it was all the first year. I tell you, dear friends, a three-year contract is the first year to catch up for what you just lost. The second year is to try to get a little bit ahead, and the third year is to try to maintain even. So you're just, you're really battling hard. But the American worker, and let's get this down straight now, the American worker is the most productive worker in the world. The most productive worker in the world. I can hear somebody say, yeah, you can expect that from Humphrey. Don't expect it from me. That's the official record. We have the best labor relations in the world. Fewer work stoppages than any other industrialized country. Not bad. We have a responsible labor movement. We've got things to do in this country. And we've gone along here, piddling along, and we've been spending billions and billions and billions. We've never made up our mind that America needed something. Forests to be replanted, cities to be rebuilt, railroads, my goodness, railroads that need modernization and rebuilding. Hundreds and thousands, over 30,000 bridges in America that are out of date, that slow up our transportation system. Ports that are too old and too small to take care of modern shipping. The list is unlimited. We're 15 years behind in reforestation. It isn't only the elm disease. 
And by the way, we ought to have an urban forestation program too. Plant trees in our cities, just as we do in our countryside. We've got things to do in this country. And I want the labor movement to start demanding that they be done. That's the way we get things done. And all of this requires work, and we're not going to go broke doing it. No nation ever went bankrupt building. You'll go bankrupt in wars. No nation ever lost its life trying to save life. You lose your life when you take life. And I ask the labor movement to really once again become the idealistic, conscious conscience of American politics. Too many people in politics today are afraid. They're afraid. They say, oh, they won't go for this. Well, I knew they wouldn't go for civil rights in 1948. I knew they wouldn't go for Medicare in 1949. I knew that they wouldn't go for the Peace Corps in 1958. And I knew they wouldn't go, if you please, for the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency in 1959. But ultimately they did. If you're going to be a man in politics, you have to be like a soldier on the battlefield. You know there are risks. There's no guarantee of your life. But as somebody once said, I'd rather live 50 years like a tiger than 100 years like a chicken. Thank you very much.